Hi, this is Kamal Alam for the Atlantic Council South Asia Center, uh, and today we're privileged to have best-selling author and investigative journalist Adrian Levy talk to us. And the major theme for today is Pakistan's intelligence services, the ISI. Three of his last bestsellers have, along with his co-author Kathy Scott Clark, have focused on the ISI, starting from the exile about Al Qaeda on the run, then ISI and Raw. Uh, a comparison, and then his latest book, which is also an HBO feature documentary, The Forever Prisoner. So Adrian, thank you very much for taking time to talk to the Atlantic Council. I can't think of any other person outside of the ISI itself that it has the information, and the access, and indeed the intelligence on the ISI that you have. So thank you for talking to us, and I'd like to start by asking you very simple question about the myth of the ISI, which has been kind of either a self-exaggeration or, or, or a perception of ISI's powers in the region. Well, first of all, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, the mythology, it, it, both, um, it both benefits um, ISI and it, it weighs really heavily on ISI. And um, what does it really relate to? Um, I think um, some of it, although not all, relates to the 1980s in particular, um, because then America, uh, particularly under Reagan from 1982 onwards, launches a secret war in Afghanistan um, as a pivot against um, the fading Soviet Union and an attempt to push the Red Army, as everyone knows, out um, of um, uh, Afghanistan using its proxies. Um, and the proxies are the Mujahideen, who um, are forming at that stage, and Pakistan is very much the staging post for that. Um, the money that flows in, the experience from the ground up that comes down to um, officers both, you know, on an operations basis, but also at, at an executive level, over eight intense years um, is extraordinary. And it's probably, um, in terms of a theatre of conflict and a theatre of practice, that there's nothing by comparison. Uh, uh, you know, the RAW, um, the Indian External Intelligence, never had that kind of uh, field experience. And yet, here you have an example where Pakistan is at war, but it's an undeclared war. And the RSI is the, uh, the proxy, uh, the conduit for that war. So, uh, in one sense, um, coming out of that, their um, real skills um, are, if you like, an essence of the myth. Real skills that are gained um, in uh, fighting um, asymmetrically, fighting covertly, using proxies, um, being battle-hardened, actually in combat and in clandestine work. Second of all, uh, their ability to transport uh, goods uh, and fungible assets anywhere in the world. So having a, um, a, uh, a network that will support um, transport uh, thirdly, um, the ability to raise um, covert funds. I mean, some of that's donations, obviously, maybe coming from the Gulf states and from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, as well as from uh, the US uh, in overt and covert funding. But there's also other kinds of black funding, which the RSI will have to uh, experiment with, which involves um, the use of um, hawala, uh, different kinds of money laundering, counterfeiting, drugs, the narco trade generally, and all of these kinds of endeavours, um, they will perfect over seven or eight years. So in a sense, there's a lot of field craft, um, a lot of grist, and a lot of capital that's going to come to RSI um, in that period. So, so, that, so that, that, that's, a key, that's a key thing to consider. So part of the myth um, is based on certain facts. Um, and then um, there is the ability to spin the myth. And um, the more um, ISI and uh, you know, the secret war gets talked about, the more that myth grows. And the myth is far larger than practice. You know, the amounts go from uh, billions into trillions that are being transported. You know. Next thing you know, you, people are talking about individual officers who are, who are billionaires, you know, li li living with um, uh, villa vi villas around Italian, um, Italian alpine lakes. I mean, there's, there's an entire kind of uh, 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 industry of myth-making that, go that goes alongside this. But um, an another portion that is true, by, this, by the same token, is uh, what will get exported out the other side of the 80s experience. So if one would consider that the 80s was the cauldron in which fieldcraft was learnt, and fighting alongside... Um, I mean, the first thing to say is there's not just two intelligence agencies that are work side by side. Uh, somebody once told me 
that um, in 1980, by 1982, um, in Peshawar, there were upwards of 18 foreign liaisons that were working at any one time. So we're talking about an enormous proliferation of intelligence agencies that are working side by side, the principal ones of which are obviously in the Gulf states um, and uh, Pakistan, America, British intelligence and other European satellite powers. Post um, the 1980s, um, there's a lot of field craft to put into practice. And so things that have been learned and observed then become the subject um, of um, operations that the R site would, would mount. And in a parallel sense, the war was also an umbrella, um, a, uh, a way of ISI deflecting from operations outside its main remit, which was helping uh, the US repel the Soviet Union. So if we consider what happened in the 1980s, in the 1980s you see, for example, um, in the region, the Punjab explode. You see Kashmir begin to simmer and then explode. So the Punjab, let's say, 1982 to 1984, Kashmir would be, uh, let's say, 1986 to 1989, when finally there's that big um, kind of almost an insurgency, we could say, by 1989. Now, both of those um, events that, of course, drag India into uh, bloody conflicts and, of course, lead to the death of one uh, prime minister, um, the assassination after Operation Blue Star, the assassination of Indira Gandhi, um, both of those events have an ISI component to it. So you have both um, ISI learning skills in a theatre, it using that theatre uh, to shelter other operations, um, and uh, it using its, um, its uh, unique status, one that couldn't be changed out for another country, swapped out for another country, its, its desirability, uh, its unique status, to engage in other kinds of foreign operations. So there's a lot going on in that period which, uh, which give, gives birth to the mythology. So, so why am I saying that, that not all the mythology is true? Um, not all the mythology is true in my mind because what people do is they, 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 they took a model surrounding ISI adventurism, let's say, and proactive operations that took place in South Asia as well as uh, its enriching and practice that took place in Afghanistan, and they apply it to pretty much everything. Anything that happens, anything that goes wrong, it becomes the ISI that are responsible, any, any kind of plot or entreaty. And what this does is it portrays, for example, India, if we're talking about the region, as passive. That what India is, India is the victim of, of Pakistan aggression, or India is the victim of ISI adventurism. And of course that's not quite true, because what's happening is India is responding to uh, the strengthening of uh, Pakistan military and ISI. In, India is also hitting back and looking at some kind of... Um, uh, some kind of reciprocal actions. And in fact, by 1983-84, particularly after the Punjab crisis comes up, um, Indian external intelligence is beginning to discuss reciprocity. And uh, conversations take place between the ISI and the ROW, and basically they say, if you make uh, the Punjab burn uh, in India, we will make Lahore burn. And if you make um, uh, Srinagar um, unsettled, we will make Karachi unsettled. Uh, and likewise, uh, Peshawar, Baluchistan, etc., etc., whichever the pinch points are for the various countries. And this notion of reciprocity grows. But because that's never owned publicly by the RAW, and those discussions remain very secret, there's a very one-sided story that's then told of the, you know, the spy wars, if you like, during that period. And that is the mythology of you know, Pakistan being the grand aggressor, Pakistan being the uh, transgressive, semi-illegal, amoral power. Um, so in that, in that sense, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the rumours are untrue. You know, of course, a lot has been said about the Afghan theatre because mm. of the last 20 years and America's longest war. Uh, and your most recent book, uh, Spy Stories, which looks at RAW and ISI. And there have been various news reports over the last few years that you were involved in a back channel mm. between RAW and the ISI. How would you crystallise where the ISI and RAW stand today with regards to peace, uh, trade? We're hearing things about uh, Pakistan wanting to normalise their relations with India. This was said in the national security document earlier this year, mm. which was headed by Dr. Moeed Yusuf, uh, the former national mm. security advisor, and the idea that uh, obviously until ISI and RAW decide for peace, there is very little the heads of state can do. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this, there's a long, complex history to this. I mean, the first thing to recognise is that there have been plenty of periods where uh, there have been attempts at um, some kind of understanding between ISI um, and um, the RAW in India. Um, and even when um, there's a public level of debate, which is quite hysterical, quite often privately, privately there's a very tangible uh, back channel that's going on. Um, before we get to the most recent one, obviously the most successful was under Musharraf. Um, and, uh, you know, it's absolutely extraordinary that using um, an old school friend of himself, he set up a, uh, a, a back channel which nobody, um, nobody believed would get anywhere um, in 2003, 2004. And, and yet, uh, by 2007, when he was weakening, um, uh, in, 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 when Musharraf was weakening in his role, that back channel um, had, um, had made extraordinary, uh, extra extraordinary strides, had taken extraordinary strides over shared waters, over Kashmir, over Gujarat, Sakrik, you name all of the, the pressure points um, in, into the regions. And, and you know, people were, at that time were talking about a, um, uh, you know, an almost one-size-fits-all deal being almost on the table. And of course, everything then collapses in a series of um, uh, monstrous and unfortunate acts, both planned and unplanned, including um, terrorist outrages like um, the Mumbai raids, etc., Musharraf's own weakening, the uprising of civil society uh, in, in, in Pakistan, and Musharraf's eventual collapse, and the death of Benazir Bhutto, of course, all of which throws all of this secret covert work into total chaos. And by the time, you know, Bhutto is dead and, uh, and a new government that, uh, comes in with her widower taking over, um, we're, we're left with no peace talks at all. So it's really important to know how near things were to completion in 2007, early 2008. Extremely near. Um, then there's a, a period of what I describe as near civil war um, in Pakistan, where a whole series of um, internal forces um, and renegade forces um, launch themselves against the state. And the state has to fight its hardest, possibly most um, consequential um, uh, existential battles since 1971. And during, during this period, um, there's enormous toll on the military and on the spy service um, just to be able to uh, uh, support and, uh, and um, give foundations to this, uh, a weakening state and repel um, the... Um, Islamist insurgencies, multiple Islamist insurgencies that are going up against the state. But once that begins to clear, uh, so we're talking really, um, once the, the large scale military operations are running from 2013, 2014, and some of that bloodshed is being tamped down, so by 2015, 2016, new back channels um, are happening all the time. Um, some of them are taking place via Thailand, some are happening in the Gulf states, um, in Dubai. There's an interesting array of um, intermediaries um, who come forward. Some of them are not so obvious and some of them are, are, are actually very obvious. Um, and it appears that quite a few people have, um, have an interest um, in bringing together both, um, both spy agencies. Interestingly, nearly all of these talks are not brokered by um, uh, European um, or North American powers. But may you know the broker, the strongest brokerage is coming from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and from uh, Gulf monarchies, etc. And occasionally Jordan has been involved. Um, and then from t uh, 2016, um, those ba those back channels uh, become um, uh, more and more essential as tensions ratchet up um, with events that are taking place, including as people watching this will probably remember. Um, the Paul Wama suicide bombings, and before that, the raid on the Pathankot Air Base in 2016 uh, in the um, Indian Punjab. And those two events, again, nearly pitch both sides to war. And so the, 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 there's, there's uh, an internal logic into making those back talks work. Two nuclear armed powers require some kind of de escalation, some kind of, uh, some kind of talking. Um, and the interesting thing is, um, and this is a very long answer to your very short question, is that during that time, the public level of rhetoric is most shrill. So just as it was during the Musharraf period, let's say between the back channel 2004 to 2007, here also between 2016 and 2019, the background political noise, if we call it that, is extraordinarily shrill. Anti-Pakistan, uh, massively chauvinist, near war situations, in fact, you know, the kind of phony war that happens with Balakot and the strike on Balakot by India and the repelling of India by Pakistan and all of those contentious issues wrapped up in the fog of war, there's still talking going on 
um, below the surface, and in fact probably more urgently um, during that period. And not only that, but some of the um, main players in the Indian security apparatus are involved in these, those talks. It's not fringe or minor, uh, you know, track three, track four, track five. We're talking about a large amount of centralization. So um, it often is the way that um, under authoritarianism, um, this is not in any way an advert for authoritarianism, but under those, uh, un un under those regimes, both on the Indian side, um, with the consolidation of power by BJP, and on the Pakistan side, under consolidation of power under Musharraf, there is more progress um, in the India um, covert spy, spy, spy discussions. Where those talks are going um, is, uh, is not entirely clear. That is quite an opaque process. And, uh, you know, there, there appears to be occasionally moments of um, optimism and then uh, things die down again um, and uh, it, 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 it appears less clear. And I'd say right now we're in a, peer, a period of great opacity and things are the least clear they've been for some time. And you, you mentioned General Musharraf, of course, his, his was the era when the war on terror was at its peak as far as American interest in the US goes. And obviously the alliance was at its peak between the CIA and, and the ISI. Yeah. And of course, individuals are important. We were talking about organization here, the ISI, but you've had a very deep uh, access and time spent, especially with General Hassan al Haq, mm. who was a very prominent head of the ISI, arguably one of the strongest. Yeah. Then General Kiani, uh, who, of course, was also the head of the military after being head of the ISI. Yeah. And, you know, in our discussions over the last decade, we've between Pakistan, Afghanistan and the West seen how a lot of Western spy agencies were very keen on working with Musharraf and then subsequently Ehsan and Jelen Kiani. And there was a Freudian slip by President Biden last year where he, was, he said, I spoke to Kiani and we discussed yes. how Afghanistan will end. Yeah. And actually, yeah. it was a fraud instead because Biden, as senator and vice president, yeah. dealt a lot with General Kiani as head of the ISI. Institutional memory. Yeah. yeah. So for all the ills of criticisms, President Biden got that right in yeah. terms of his, when he mentioned Kiani. How would you describe General Ehsan and Kiani's time yeah, it's, it's as a, heads of the ISI? It's a good question. And it kind of interplays with a lot of the other things that you're asking, a few of the other things you're asking. The first thing that, um, that I should have said before, and this is a prompt for me to say, it, is the largest period for professionalization and reform of ISI takes place under General SNL al -Hak. Um, the agency becomes something, uh, the directorate becomes something completely different. It will take, you know, 10, 11, 12 years for um, the structural changes that he puts in place and the, um, the, the change in um, outlook and internal professionalization and discipline for those things, for those things to really, really hit home. Um, and along the way, while the agency is massively transforming, um, it's also in practice fighting a war. You know, it's initially fighting a war as an ally of the US and then it's fighting with the US and an internal um, war and it also has to put up um, its own kind of resistance against um, India on the um, eastern border. And so it's probably spread more thinly than uh, anyone could possibly realise. So there's this constant reform that's taking place and uh, another element of the constant reform which is triggered by General Hassan uh, from 2002 onwards is this notion which um, w was projected everywhere of de-radicalisation, de-radicalisation of the ISI. And uh, as he always said, there was never in his mind radicalisation. What there was was like greater professionalisation. So one of the great myths of ISI is, for example, that it's not coherent, that there are rogue elements that there are breakaway groups of spies and special operatives who no one knows about and basically uh, carry out unconscionable operations um, all around the world, but especially in the region. Well, what's good news um, and bad news, I guess, um, because there's a downside to this, is that the organisation under SM becomes massively coherent and uh, responds to military discipline, um, is professionalised and works along um, the basis of um, a chain of command. Um, the reason why that's also bad news is it means that the ISA can't shirk responsibility when something happens and there's clearly a link to the intelligence services. But by the same token, uh, there's plenty of other stuff, excuse me, that's credited to them that is not their uh, responsibility or their remit. And remember, in the fog of war, both sides are using proxies, both sides are using false flag operations and the full gamut of confusing devices that uh, place responsibility um, for different events. Um, or at least, uh, let's say, should we say, 
mask responsibility for, for key events. So it, it's never quite clear who, who actually um, is doing what. A, a great example of that, just to take us to the here and now, is the current debate that's taking place, place over ISIK, um, Islamic State, um, Khorasan, sorry. Um, there's this huge push once more um, by India um, that's really actually been going, going on since 2017 to say that uh, Islamic State in um, Afghanistan is another front of um, the ISIS. And it suits, of course, a certain kind of logic within Indian intelligence to present that as the case, you know, all of the anarchy that's associated with that. That would mean, therefore, that the bombing, um, suicide bombings um, and attacks on Kabul airport, for example, that hideous event that happened during the, um, the, uh, the evacuation, would be uh, Pakistan's responsibility. So, again, uh, yet again, working to divide Pakistan and America and to make that relationship unworkable. By the same token, uh, Pakistan's been talking about um, Islamic State, Khorasan, <laughs> as frequently, and has said that it's, a, it's, it's a, a false flag operation run by the RAW. You know, so you can see that there's, there's still this jousting that's taking place. So, so if, we, if we look to answer the middle meat of your question, um, the, the Directorate and Intelligence is under a process of massive reform. Um, what people call, for example, the Kayani Doctrine, or you know, later on would also be called the Bajwa Doctrine in terms of you know, the evolution of these ideas. Those, those names are, are actually unnecessary because um, the military and the intelligence um, services are, a, are an enormous oil carrier and they're moving very slowly, one degree to the left, one degree to the right. And the plans that are set in motion actually took place after the war on terror, America's war on terror was declared. So what these different charismatic, well-known chiefs are doing is actually continuing with strategies that have been laid by uh, the founders or the, you know, the signees, the architects of those strategies, who include, I do believe, uh, people like General Hassan al-Haq. He may, in the end, have done more structurally to change the ISI um, than, uh, than, uh, than anyone else. And yet we kind of, as, 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 as President Biden let slip, you know, we kind of associate it with, for example, Kayani, because he seemed to be so Western facing um, in, in his relations. But of course, under the, in that period, um, you know, you, um, the, that period um, also includes the raid on Abbottabad. So, uh, you know, by 2011, uh, when bin Laden's dead in May, um, you know, the relationship between ISI and um, CIA is at its nadir. So, um, you know, it's a complex, um, it's a complex process, a, a complex process both in terms of the RAW and in terms of the CIA. But just the final thing I'm thinking, the final relevant afterthought here, is um, it's also revealing that um, President Trump came to power in 2017 and declared the Pakistan relationship dead. And uh, his rhetoric um, in the presidentials in 2016 was very much, you know, get out of Afghanistan, kill the Pakistan deals, uh, we've been betrayed and, 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 you know, it's all been a case of double dealing. And almost immediately after, you know, the dust has settled and he's ensconced in, in, in the Oval Office, covert talks begin again with um, CIA and ISI. And in fact, by uh, October 2017, they're um, planning through interlocutors um, a new approach towards Afghanistan and a new approach towards the Taliban. Uh, as part of uh, Trump's promise to de-escalate and withdraw troops from Afghanistan. So despite all that rhetoric and the Twitter war at that time from the president was absolutely hammering the, uh, the Pakistan civilian state, you know, declaring America's interests first, um, criticizing and lambasting um, military and intelligence relations with the state, and yet privately they were reheating those relations and actually an intense period of um, co-authored work takes place between CIA, ISI uh, from October 2017, which may be as productive and as intense as anything that took place between 2002 and 2006, when most Al-Qaeda high-value targets in Pakistan were detained. You talk about high-value targets, and this is where the operators come into play. And again, uh, everyone hears about the generals, but no one hears about the majors, the colonels those that are unseen. Yeah. And again, you've had access, I personally know, on the ground, in the mountains, in the cities, mm. talking or with them. That part is missing in international debate that, yes, of course, Abtabad is measured as a massive failure. 
Yeah. But then 16 of the top 20 Al-Qaeda leaders were captured by these very operators, the majors and the colonels that you've met. How would you describe the operators being disconnected or, as you mentioned, work on their own? Or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, I'm I think the whole thing is bent out of shape, you know. I think there's a lot of Islamophobia um, that takes place here um, and a lot of successful um, adverse diplomacy by other powers and nation states that denigrate Pakistan. Um, and, uh, you know, and there are some own goals. Yeah, you know, we've discussed them over the years. Uh, Pakistan has not helped itself in certain situations where it could have been clearer um, and uh, certainly made um, its case clearer um, where it stands in relation to certain things that the world generally sees as outrages that have taken place. But um, it's undeniably true that um, when um, General Hassan al Haq set up um, and reformed um, a proper specialist counter-terrorism centre within ISI, placed a brigadier in charge of that, um, and that brigadier had two bosses, as he said at the time. Um, one of those um, was um, the head of um, US um, counter-terrorism within CIA, and the other one was SNL Haq within ISI, and he was literally commuting every six weeks between uh, Pakistan and between uh, Pakistan and between Virginia. Um, and, you know, the operation was extraordinarily close. Um, in the way that institutions don't want to talk about, you know, I mean, they were inside each other's pockets. And you, you have this, uh, this period, which, you know, has, it, has its peaks and troughs. I mean, in the middle of all of this, of course, is, is, uh, is, is horrible events like the Daniel Pearl killing, which in itself, you know, was affected by the smog of war. And, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 there, are many, uh, there are many episodes that take place which, um, which let's say, skew the narrative as to, as, as to who is an ally of who, uh, who and certainly uh, add, add, um, add spice, spice to the debate. But, but nevertheless, it is substantially true that nearly all those operations are successful, even when there's mistrust between both sides. And now with retrospect, you know, plenty of people in CIA will say, oh, gee, you know, we never trusted, uh, you know, ISI and we kept certain targets really quiet. We thought it was a leaky ship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, between 2001 and 2007, Virtually every um, legitimately um, held high-value target that was in Pakistan was detained at the behest or with joint intelligence operations by CIA, ISI, and involving Gulf powers and others. And a lot of those operations took place inside Karachi. Um, and uh, people who are on, uh, as, as you're pointing out, who are operators, who are, who are working, um, uh, you know, in... Uh, on, on very specific specialist desks, those guys didn't sleep for six years. And so you get a very, very different story. I mean, it's a kinetic story of sort of, uh, of warfare. And the same goes for the military, by the way. It's not just, uh, you know, RSI. Um, any, any military that then became involved um, in counterinsurgency more, more broadly, um, you know, the, the, the count of ferocity of battle and the losses that, that take place are, are, are phenomenal. But because no one memorialises those events, or refers to them, and a lot of them are shrouded in secrecy. Everyone just moves on. We've moved on from, uh, you know, the, um, the containment of Al-Qaeda. We've moved on. A another similar success, if you like, is that um, a lot of the Islamist insurgent outfits that turned against Pakistan and the ISI, who include people like uh, Jaysh Mohammed and associated groups, um, those groups were also squeezed over, you know, eight, nine, ten years and then pushed into Helmand in Afghanistan, where their operating bases are now. And the cost um, for that, uh, for ISI, on, on a much lower, lower level on the grassroots was enormous. Uh, you know, they've never fully reported or told, not been allowed to report or tell on the number of deaths um, that have taken place in undeclared um, attacks, suicide bombings, targeted assassinations. I think someone told me um, in ISI that they um, had worked out that there were 18 attempts on Musharraf in total, of which only, I think, three have ever been declared. The twin attempts to blow him up in his armoured Mercedes are two of the events that were declared. And uh, I think the third um, incident that was mentioned was uh, a rumour that was an attempt to kill him at a, at a mosque in Islamabad. Involve, involving a suicide bomber. But actually, RSI had 18, there were 18 conspiracies. And one group um, that was responsible for the lion's share of those were ex-special forces who'd left the military, um, had been radicalised, oh, that, that's, that's the wrong term, but become politicised, let's say, uh, and then waged their own war against Pakistan, against America and the Pakistan security forces. So, you know, it, it's, it's an, it's an there's an amazing amount of tumult 
of, of lives lost and of service that will never go recorded. It's part of the culture, I think, to keep these things thoroughly secret. And so um, the result is there are very few books written on it that either you know, celebrate successes and by the same token, that deeply critique things that go hideously wrong you know, when mistakes are made. There's not that culture that's encouraged. And you mentioned about uh, you know, the relationships and how the deep relationship between the ISI and the CIA. It's almost as if the ISI and CIA have a parallel relation, which is different to the civilian leaders. And even if state-to-state -state relations aren't good, even if the prime minister and president don't talk, it doesn't matter. Because as far as US national security goes, the only people that matter are the ISI and obviously an extension, the military. And, yeah. uh, you know, you've had a lot of time with the former uh, late general Hamid Gul. Mm. And in fact, you know, despite all the negative publicity around him, we know that on his funeral, two very senior retired CIA folks turned up out of respect and their wives, including a former director, Casey's wife, yeah. sent her condolences to Hamid Gould's wife. So yeah. there's a very, there's a love-hate relationship that's also extremely contradictory. Last year, President, or former President Trump goes on Fox News yeah. and praises General Faiz Hamid, yeah. saying he helped us end the war and he saved thousands of lives of Americans in the evacuation. Yet, you know, you have these two, you've got a Frankenstein Mm. whereby there's the love which turns into hate between the US and uh, Pakistan. There's a lot of things to unpick there. First of all, there's the difference between public rhetoric and private action. You know, and, 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 what, and you know, that, that is the ethics. I always call that surface noise. There's surface noise and then, then there's covert action. And you know, as everyone knows, you know, what states say to each other privately is very different from what politicians need to say in order to stay in power or get re-elected. And so you know, there's the permanent structures that exist beneath states. Um, and one of those permanent structures that has you know, gone through uh, the gamut of emotions is the relationship between CIA and ISI. And the really important thing to realise, um, of course, as you do, but as uh, may be interesting to discuss more generally, is this is a very historic relationship, you know, and um, although there's plenty of chatter that goes into the 50s, it really solidifies in the 60s. And, you know, in, in the 60s, Pakistan, um, there's great papers that uh, were recently declassified in the, the National Security Archive in Washington that show the way in which um, the first bases inside Pakistan were covertly leased to Americans in, or for, in, in order for them to run secret overhead operations um, monitoring um, uh, Russian and Chinese, Soviet and Chinese um, nuclear developments. Um, and Peshawar was the airbase from which they, uh, you know, at least airbase from which they ran those secret um, um, overhead operations. The U-2 flight with Gary Powers in it, the fated U-2 flight with Gary Powers, took off from Peshawar. And this nascent relationship takes place. And then CIA and ISI get together in the 1960s. And in exchange for um, leasing bases, which of course then will become a contentious issue in every decade that follows afterwards, um, they give them... Um, more experience in paramilitary operations and proxy warfare. And of course, that then will lead to nascent operations with joint operations, if you like, between CIA, um, ISI um, in the 60s and the fermenting of a culture within ISI. So these relationships go back a long way. They're, they're, they're historic. They cover many of the great pinch points, pinch points of histories. And they do, you know, there, there, there are times where you know, they fall to pieces. They, they, they fall to pieces in trust and confidence. Pakistan has gone through a state um, uh, encouraged by uh, the CIA, I would say, of undoing um, the um, civil society structures at a certain time. The bad side of the whole Musharraf period was the undoing of that, the parallel criminal justice system. Um, you know, a whole, a whole series of abductions that took place, uh, non-referral to the police and courts, uh, black sites, and all of these things that were put in practice during the Musharraf period, where I've read figures of between six and 8,000 people being detained over, over a period in time, you know, they themselves were a mirror of the renditions and black sites program that was being run with impunity by CIA. So there's a kind of encouraging that even took, took place. And then the thing that's never said clearly is there's also national interest, which means how many pacts Pakistan makes with CIA and ISI ultimately the national interest of the country will come before any of those pacts and so there will be limits to how much um, they will enjoy. So when America acts surprised and says, you know, um, ISI didn't come the whole way with us on Afghanistan, <laughs> you know, go figure. 
I mean, you know, Pakistan was saying right from 2001, you know, these are our red lines. Our red lines include Taliban, our red lines include uh, preferential status with government in Kabul, not having enemies in Kabul. You know, those red lines were declared from October. Uh, 2001, and were reinforced by Tony Blair, reinforced by the Kingdom of Saudi, Saudi Arabia. So, so some of this is politicking by all sides, you know. And remember that to the victor, you know, the victor, the victor creates history. And in that sense, you know, America has dictated the terms in which we view a lot of these things. Um, and lately, I think India, India has dictated the terms in, in, in which we uh, view a lot of these things. India having been over a large period of time, a military and economic victor in, in, in the region. And so we, we've got to be very careful. It's all a hall of mirrors. There are many, many, many different distortions. And just one final thing. I mean, you know, that's not to say that things have not also gone hideously wrong and there have not been bad operations that have, that have backfired, because there have been. And uh, I'm sure there have been a huge amount of naval gazing over those. I know that from my personal interviews that the whole uh, Mumbai raid episode in 2611 caused massive introspection. In, uh, inside ISI military, not because they configured the conspiracy, but because of what they may have known about that conspiracy and chosen not to say. And the same way uh, we could say with the RAW, they also knew a lot about the forming of that conspiracy. And you know, the, the, there, there, there's still a lot of fog over what actually happened with 2611, meaning you know who knew what at what time. Undoubtedly, a, a team of gunmen, uh, you know, went by boat from Karachi landed and held hostage to Mumbai, killing um, whatever it is, 165, 167 people um, in a hideous event over three days. But that event has caused a huge amount of introspection uh, with ISI. Um, and you know, there is that lessons learned faculty where they'll return to these things and look at them, look at the handling of the fallout, looking at their communication within the organisation, looking at the way their specialist desks operate, in, in, you know, and, 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 and how, how, how much better they could be at, uh, you know, at, at improving that. But that doesn't necessarily stop those outrages taking place. So, you know, it's, it's an extraordinary journey. Well, we, we need a week to discuss this, I feel. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And you, you finally, briefly, you mentioned the Gulf countries, mm. India, Iran. Iran and Pakistan have a real battle on the border. Yeah. And the intelligence wars, which you mention in your book, Exile, yeah. of even Al-Qaeda on the run. And, you know, would you say Iran and Pakistan are a battle on, towards each other, not just on the border, but for control for many groups? Yes, definitely right. I mean, it's a really interesting and, and, and sort of... Uh, and, 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 and not widely debated um, area, and, it, and it's something that you know, we should spend a lot more time looking at. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I Iran uh, took advantage of um, a situation in Al-Qaeda to gain some kind of leverage and offered shelter, and we documented it with, um, with interviews um, inside the exile, and it kept um, Al-Qaeda families, bin Laden families, key families um, and individuals within the religious, the religious shura um, and in the sort of political and military apparatus of Al-Qaeda. Um, initially invited as guests, then from guests they become hostages, then they're moved into um, uh, a former palace, um, which is the IRGC headquarters in northern Tehran, and then they're actually more like hostages than guests, and then a whole series of uh, uh, you know, power plays take place. Um, and uh, Iran attempts to use um, its possession um, to leverage um, talks with America and go, go about the process of normalising relations with America. But in 2002, America and 2003, America is already focusing on, on, on Iraq and so absolutely wants nothing to do with the overtures um, from Iran and so loses the opportunity to wrap up effectively an entire section of Al-Qaeda in order to uh, roll out its, its uh, extended political programme under Cheney and others to, uh, you know, the, the logic being... Um, we're gonna, we're gonna depose Saddam Hussein, and after that we're gonna come for Iran. We don't need peace right now. So, so Iran, Iran presented itself in an interesting pragmatic position there. Uh, it failed um, in what it wanted to achieve. Uh, it then keeps hold of those prisoners. But at the same time, there's a proxy war then taking place also on Pakistan's border in Taftan and other places in Balochistan. And CIA takes advantage of that again. There's another amazing episode that takes place um, and in that episode, um, when America um, is become steeped um, in its own civil war um, in uh, Iraq, America then looks at payback for Ahmadinejad, uh, then the president um, of Iran. And America, um, the CIA, 
um, considers uh, an operation whereby every time um, Iranian proxies, uh, the Mahdi army, etc., the Shia militia that are operating inside Iraq, every time they hit um, an American target, uh, a covert operation will take place on the Pakistan border where um, a IRGC, Iranian target, will be hit using proxies controlled by CIA and ISI. And the ISI have talked about those operations. And a quite extraordinary period builds up where basically, you know, you're getting a mirroring between conflict that's taking place inside Iraq and conflict that's taking place on the, on the Taftan border. And one of those attacks, which was co-sponsored by um, um, uh, in, in this relationship between uh, CIA and ISI was an Ahmadinejad himself and a presidential convoy. And then after that, um, the attacks get more and more brutal because there's very little control over the group responsible and they attack girls' schools and, you know, things unconscionable things happen. And, of course, the whole thing blows up anyhow because in the nature of these, um, these um, false, false um, covert wars, everyone loses control of nearly all the forces who are involved. But it becomes clear from, from that, that, th those examples how important Iran is. And the parallel port situation would then continue to make, uh, make it vital. The parallel port being the rivalry between Gwada ports in Baluchistan and Chabahar port um, in, uh, in, in Iran, both um, campaigning. Uh, to be the ports that capture Central Asia. And so, you know, there's, the, 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 there's, there's enormous reasons for both sides to, uh, to, to, to mistrust each other. And uh, just the final, the final reason why it becomes uh, massively significant is not only because of uh, America's fear um, with Iran um, and Iran's ability to use and mount proxy warfare uh, throughout the region, but also uh, because... Um, uh, India has made a big play um, with Iran and also with Chabahar port. And so what you've got then is a, a really interesting geopolitical axis that builds up on that one hot border, which is barely written about. You've got China and Pakistan attempting to create, you know, a, uh, an enormously interesting logistical maritime hub in Chabahar, um, something that's causing enormous annoyance and frustration, particularly during the Trump period. And then you've got India having invested quite heavily, both in terms of field craft and cash, in, uh, uh, in Gwada, sorry, that was it, in Gwada, in Chabahar. Um, and that's an operation, of course, which, um, which um, causes tremendous frustration um, in, in, in Pakistan. And so, you know, I mean, th this is an age-old age old issue, you know, which goes all the way right the way then back to the 1970s and 1980s with General Zia's fear of, you know, fifth column of... Um, Fifth columns inside uh, Pakistan, mistrusting Shia, the Shia population of Pakistan, persecuting Shia businessmen and landowners, etc., um, and setting up those um, sectarian fronts like Sipa al Sahaba to combat those sectarian fronts, the anti Iranian influence within the military and within, um, within the RSI. So it's an enormous hot button topic. It's as relevant now as it was you know, in the Zia period in, 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 19, in 1982. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one that merits a lot more study. And finally, thank you for taking time, Adrian. And as I mentioned, the three books of yours, uh, The Exile, I, Sai, Raw, and the latest one, Forever Prisoner, which is also an HBO documentary. A final summary, if you could, in a minute or two. What is the big takeaway for the ISI, for, for security watchers as well as the international community, Going forward, as you just mentioned, the Iran-China angle, uh, of course, the attention being away from Afghanistan now decreased in importance. What does ISI do now? Yeah, I mean, that's a really hard question. I, you know, I'd love to displace that just by saying that that's for the ISI to decide. But I think getting heard is really hard now. Um, I think there's a transactional relationship where, uh, you know, they're needed for things. Um, and they do those things when they're needed. But getting heard is really hard. I mean, you know, the agenda has swung massively um, towards obviously countering or dealing with uh, what's going on in Russia right now, uh, and particularly in, in light of, uh, you know, Kaliningrad and, uh, and Lithuania, etc. You know, the, <laughs> there's a huge amount, of, huge amount of time being spent on that. Um, so get, getting heard in all forums is, is, proving, is proving really tricky. Um, you, you know... Obviously, one area um, that they've been focusing on very much has been the Financial Action Task Force. We've just come through a period um, of very important meetings where Pakistan has a case to make um, that it's clamping down on what it's been told to clamp down on in terms of terrorist funding and money laundering, 
uh, you know, the actions that it may or may not have taken over Lashkar Toiba, leading to, you know, we'll, we'll see what the outcome is. It's certainly, uh, at the very worst, will stay on the grey list. Maybe it will come off that and just be a country not on the grey list, which in itself would, would be a significant move. There's a lot of rivalry taking place to own the international space. Um, that's previously been totally dominated by India that moves extremely well diplomatically with huge amount of finesse. And Pakistan has been on a back foot, I feel, um, particularly at the United Nations um, and in other forum like FATF. But now we're seeing other interesting little counter moves taking place, attempts to show the way in which um, India is not so benign, um, also has covert programs that it's been using, uh, encouraging Pakistan Taliban TTP style operations, uh, fomenting the situation in Karachi um, and in Baluchistan, and the attempt to gain traction with those ideas in international forums is definitely much more of a new development for Pakistan, trying to win those debates. So I think um, uh, the third area I'd probably identify, which is the easiest, again, an easy one really for me to talk about, is, is, is soft power. I think trying to improve their soft power. India is an absolutely superb proponent of soft power. You know, uh, it places itself um, uh, brilliantly um, inside think tanks the world over, um, inside premier academic institutions and universities. Um, it, it lets the diaspora donate to, um, to create chairs and departments. And they seed beautifully the idea of India um, through those institutions and through their cultural exports. And, 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 and undoubtedly, I think, um, RSI is beginning to realise that that, that dimension of warfare, if you like, <laughs> that soft cultural economic warfare is every bit as important as the covert long chess games that take place in the region. So I feel that that's something that's been, uh, I've certainly picked up uh, on, on, on discussions taking place. And there are, there, there are lots of missing mystery pieces. Uh, those mystery pieces include um, Turkey, that's a mystery piece for ISI, um, what to do with their relationship with Turkey, um, what it means, um, and the continual internal debate over Saudi Arabia. How important will KSA continue to be? Um, what is, at the moment, the um, relationship? And, uh, you know, how will that grow? And, of course, that's in relation particularly into the blossoming post-2013 and particularly post-2015 of CPEC. So, you know, the advent of large amounts of Chinese cash is, has changed that. And the final thing I'd say, um, which I feel is another safe bet to you know, in this very dangerous territory of crystal ball gazing, which I don't like to take part in, is obviously the management of China requires huge dexterity by um, ISI, massive dexterity. Because on one hand, there's the promise of huge amounts of, uh, you know, infrastructural benefit, which has now gone beyond infrastructure into, um, you know, power generation, all sorts of other stuff, um, you know, and the joint manufacturing projects and training projects. But beyond that, there's also this idea of recognising we're in a multipolar world. And that means rather than um, simply wholesale accepting all Chinese funding, trying to balance US desires, Turkish, Gulf, Saudi desires against Chinese desires. And that becomes a much, much, much more difficult, complex tapestry. Much more difficult. Um, and then the final piece, I think, is the one that they, I'd say that they're least clear about. Um, and I've just not really encountered any sort of real sense that, um, that, that there's a clear plan is, of course, Afghanistan, you know, and uh, where, where that is heading, it's, it's very unclear at the moment. Um, perhaps because it's too hot, we're in it right now. There are lots of defensive, very sensitive talks taking place with different factions, TTP, Haqqani Network being used as intermediaries, you know, with the Pakistan Taliban talks. So, you know, they're busy. It's a busy region, you know, just because Ukraine has dominated the headlines, it doesn't mean that these, is these issues are continuing. It's just that it's so hard to find the, find the time to talk about them. So thank you for giving us the opportunity. Thank you, Adrian, very much. And indeed, look forward to having you again on Atlantic's forum to talk on, on these subjects, as you say, so much to talk about. Thanks for joining Atlantic Council. Pleasure. Thank Thanks. you very much. Well, that was Adrian Levy talking to the Atlantic Council South Asia Centre about the ISI uh, with a focus on his last three books, uh, Forever Prisoner, which is also an HBO film, uh, ISI Raw and The Exile. Thanks for watching this. <laughs>